Financial Reporting Quality. This reading has five sections, an introduction where we'll talk about the concept of financial reporting quality and earnings quality. Then we will discuss a conceptual view of financial reporting quality and show that financial reporting quality can be thought of as a spectrum. Section 3 gives us as analysts a context for assessing financial reporting quality. Section 4 deals with the detection of financial reporting quality issues and Section 5 is a summary of the most important points from the reading. Let's get a basic sense for what we mean when we say financial reporting quality. A high level point here is that obviously many companies report their financial results and the quality of the financial reports varies a lot from company to company. So what do we mean by high quality financial reporting? High quality financial reporting provides information that is useful to analysts in assessing a company's performance and prospects. Low quality financial reporting contains inaccurate, misleading or incomplete information. An important point to note here is that when we say financial reporting quality, we are not talking about high earnings or high equity. What we are talking about is how well is the financial information presented. In other words, with good quality financial reporting, the numbers presented or the reports presented will give a good indication of the underlying economic reality. A related concept is the quality of reported results. This is also sometimes referred to as earnings quality. So what does high earnings quality mean? High quality earnings result from activities that a company will likely be able to sustain in the future and provide a sufficient return on the company's investment. Two major items to note here. When we say high quality earnings, the first important item is that high quality earnings means that the earnings should be sustainable. Just because the earnings are high in a given period, but let's say that these high earnings are because of accrual based earnings, let's say a high accounts receivable, so high sales and high net income, but we do not expect similar high sales in the future. What is going to happen to earnings in the future? Earnings are going to come down, so the sustainability is low. We would then say that the quality of earnings is low. The other aspect is provide a sufficient return to the company's investment. Obviously, funds have been invested in the company. There is a cost associated with those funds that is called the cost of capital or the cost of funds. The earnings should be high enough that the return that a company is receiving or the return for investors should be higher than the cost of funds. When that is also happening, then we can say that we have high quality earnings. We've talked about the fact that financial reporting quality can vary a lot across companies. The lowest quality reports contain information that is pure fabrication. At the other end of the spectrum, high quality reports contain information that is relevant complete, neutral, and free from error. And this statement actually comes from the conceptual framework that you studied early in your FRA education. We now connect the concept of financial reporting quality with earnings quality. If the financial reporting quality is low, then this makes it difficult to evaluate the financial statements and hence difficult to evaluate earnings quality. And this is how the curriculum expresses it. Low financial reporting quality impedes assessment of earnings quality and therefore impedes valuation. Obviously, high quality reports will make it easier to assess earnings quality and therefore make it easier to value a company. Now, these two statements make it clear that if the financial reporting quality is low, then it becomes difficult to even start assessing earnings quality. So the discussion of earnings quality really matters or is relevant when we have relatively high quality financial reporting. Now, given that we have high quality financial reporting, the earnings quality 
or the quality of reported results could be low or high and this again is a mini spectrum. We've mentioned earlier that low quality earnings means that earnings are unsustainable and relatively low compared to the cost of funds. High quality earnings would mean that earnings or the return that investors are getting are relatively high and the earnings are sustainable. In other words, we expect relatively high earnings to continue in the future. We can combine the concepts of financial reporting quality and earnings quality to create a spectrum. Simplistically, the best case scenario is that the quality of financial reports is high and the earnings quality is also high and that is depicted right here, the top left part of the spectrum. This is how the curriculum puts it. Gap or generally accepted accounting principles are being followed. The information is decision useful, sustainable and the returns are adequate. Let's understand each of these points in more detail. Gap or generally accepted accounting principles is being used generically here and this implies that the accepted accounting principles for the particular jurisdiction are being followed. In the US context, this would be US GAAP. In most other parts of the world, this would be IFRS. Decision useful is extremely important. Simplistically, this is saying that the information that is being presented should be useful in terms of making decisions. Now, what does that entail? The information must be relevant and material. Again, if you recall from your early readings in FRA, when we say material, we are referring to information that is useful in making decisions. So that's an important aspect here. Other attributes of the information that is presented should be that the information is comparable, the information presented should be verifiable, it should be timely and understandable. These two elements, the first two items in this box, really connect with the quality of financial reporting. The other items, sustainable and adequate returns, connect with earnings quality. As we've discussed before, sustainable means that the earnings numbers are likely to continue into the future. And adequate returns means that the return on investment is relatively high. And in this case, it would be relative to the cost of capital. So if earnings are sustainable, earnings are relatively high, and the information is very useful in making decisions, then we are at the top end or the most helpful end of the spectrum. In this case, the valuation associated with the company where all these hold true will be relatively high. One step down is this item. Gap, so generally accepted accounting principles are being followed. Decision useful, but there is a question about the sustainability of earnings. In other words, it appears that the earnings quality is low. So using the same symbols that I have used earlier, the quality of financial reporting is high. In other words, the information is being presented well, it is decision useful, the accounting principles are being followed, but the earnings quality is relatively low. Perhaps there is a very high accrual element in the earnings numbers, which leads an investor to believe that the earnings numbers will not continue to be high in the future. So this means that the earnings quality is relatively low. The curriculum gives a good example of low earnings quality. In the first quarter of fiscal year 2014, Toyota Motor Company reported a surge in operating income. In fact, operating income increased by 88%. But this increase was largely because of exchange rate fluctuations. Toyota is a Japanese company and most of Toyota sales happen outside Japan. The increase in operating income expressed in yen was primarily because of changes in exchange rates and not because Toyota was selling more cars. Now this is not sustainable. Therefore, we can say that even though the earnings were high in this particular quarter, but earnings quality would be low because it is not sustainable. 
As we travel further down the spectrum, the next item is within gap but biased choices. So this is saying that accounting principles are being followed in letter but perhaps not in spirit because the choices that are being made are not properly reflecting the economic reality, the underlying economic reality. Let's understand biased choices in a little more detail. One aspect of biased choices is aggressive accounting, where a company tries to show that the current period's performance is better than what it actually should be. A very simple example is to understate depreciation. We'll see this in more detail later, but take a situation where the depreciation expense should be, let's say, 100,000 for a given period, but the company decides to depreciate over a longer period than is appropriate and actually shows a lower depreciation expense of 80,000. This will make the earnings number for the current period look relatively better and that is an example of aggressive accounting which is biasing the earnings number. Another aspect of biased choices is with respect to the volatility of earnings. What some companies do is smooth the expenses or smooth the earnings numbers. And finally, there might also be a bias in how information is presented. So positive information might be presented very clearly and conspicuously, whereas negative information might be presented in a way that makes it difficult for analysts to understand or read. The curriculum gives the example of a company, Thakar, where this third sort of bias exists. What the company does is it doesn't clearly show segment information related to its sales and that would fall under this third category of presenting information in a biased manner. Moving further down the quality spectrum, we have within gap but earnings management. Earnings management is sometimes written as EM and here is the definition given in the curriculum. Earnings management represents deliberate actions to influence reported earnings and their interpretation. At a high level, earnings management, where management is trying to influence the earnings, can happen in two ways. Either real earnings management or accounting earnings management. An example of real earnings management would be where in a given period, management cuts down the research and development expenditure so that the earnings for that period look better than they would otherwise appear. So this is real because the R&D has actually been cut and the earnings are actually better. But if cutting that R&D is not in the long-term interest of the company and it's simply being done to make earnings in a given period look better, then that is what is being discussed over here. The other item is accounting earnings management. Here, a company uses accounting choices such as the amount of depreciation or let's say bad debt allowance in order to influence the earnings number. This looks a lot like the biased choices that we talked about earlier. The difference between biased choices and earnings management is really intent. And since the intent is not always obvious, for example, perhaps there are certain biased choices which are taking place because management wants to be conservative versus there might be certain earnings management choices which management is making in order to perhaps take higher losses today so that the management team can look better in the next period, it's very hard to identify that intent. And that is why often these items are bundled together. Next, we come to non-compliant accounting. Here, the quality of financial reporting is extremely low. In fact, it is almost non-existent. Information is being presented that does not depict economic reality and numbers are being presented in a way that are not even following generally accepted accounting principles. A classic example is Enron in the late 90s. 
they engaged in complex transactions and then presented information in a way that made the level of debt appear much lower than it actually was and the operating profits and cash flow from operations appeared to be much higher than they actually were. And finally, right at the bottom of the spectrum, we have fictitious transactions. So this is clear outright fraud in the sense that companies are reporting transactions that never took place. We now come to the concept of conservative and aggressive accounting. It is important to understand this material and to do so I will create a simple example and then we will use that example to discuss several points. Let's say that our company has made some credit sales and based on the collections that we expect, in other words based on what we actually expect to receive from the customer in the future, our earnings in a given period would be 20. It is possible however that we collect less than expected in which case earnings would be 10 and it's also possible that we collect more than expected in which case the earnings would be 30. The question now is what should be reported? Ideally our financial reporting should be unbiased which means that if the probability of each of these three is one third then the unbiased number is 20. However, investors may prefer conservative accounting choices. In other words, here the conservative accounting choice would be to report earnings of 10. And why is it generally perceived that investors prefer conservative choices? The answer is straightforward. Investors would much rather receive a positive surprise than a negative surprise. If 20 is reported and then it turns out that collections are less than expected and the earnings have to be written down to 10, that would not look good and investors would be quite unhappy. It is generally perceived that managers prefer aggressive accounting because through aggressive accounting management can report earnings of 30 in the current period and it will appear that the quarter was quite good. Aggressive accounting decreases reported performance and financial position in later periods. So if management does make this aggressive choice of reporting net income of 30 in the current period and then in the next period the collections actually are such that the earnings should have been 20. So collections are less than the assumptions made here then what will happen to earnings in the next period? Earnings in the next period would be lower. So that is the challenge or the issue with aggressive accounting. Conservative choices do not typically decrease reported performance and financial position in later periods. So the conservative choice of 10 would hopefully cause the earnings number in the future to be higher. Conservative means that the company is reporting a relatively low earnings number for the current period in the hope or expecting that if there is a positive surprise, if the amount of money collected is what was originally expected, then in later periods the earnings number will be better. The concept of conservatism is highlighted by the fact that there is a different degree of scrutiny associated with revenue recognition and expense recognition. When we are recognizing revenue, we only do so when the revenue is earned and we are reasonably certain of collecting the funds. This is when there is credit sales such as what we discussed in the context example at the start of the slide. With expenses, however, we recognize them even when they are simply probable. Putting these two points together means that generally speaking in the current period the earnings will tend to be understated. Continuing with the same idea, I want to emphasize the fact that the conceptual framework supports neutrality of information. So what is this conceptual framework? You might recall from one of the readings early in the level 1 curriculum on financial reporting standards that 
The financial reporting conceptual framework is laid out and there are several attributes of what a financial reporting framework should be like. Here, one segment of that discussion has been reproduced. The conceptual framework says that there should be faithful representation, information that faithfully represents an economic phenomenon that it purports to represent is ideally complete neutral and free from error. Complete means that all information necessary to understand the phenomenon is depicted. Neutral means that information is selected and presented without bias. And that's a key point over here. So this is the ideal scenario. But as we've discussed, many accounting standards are conservatively biased. Conservatism protects contracting parties. To understand this point, let's consider a simple example where a company needs to borrow money from a bank. The bank is the third party or the contracting party. Obviously, the company has much more information about its earnings numbers and expenses relative to the contracting party or the third party. So, the risks are higher for the bank and the information is lower for the bank. Clearly, if the earnings numbers are presented in a conservative manner, that would be safer for the bank. Also, conservatism reduces possibility of litigation. Going back to the simple example from the previous slide, let's say that the earnings numbers that could be reported in a given period are 10, 20 and 30 and say that a company goes with the neutral number 20. Later, for reasons outside the company's control, the collections are lower than expected and the company has to write down the earnings number which causes the stock price to crash and potentially then there might be lawsuits. Lots of angry shareholders will say that the company misrepresented information and that can create an awkward situation for the company. To avoid situations like that, the company might simply conservatively report numbers because if later on the earnings numbers are higher, that will not create any sort of lawsuits. Before moving on, let's just think about some accounting standards which are conservatively biased. The classic example is research, where any research costs need to be expensed, which causes earnings numbers to come down. Another example is litigation costs. And quoting from the curriculum here, when it becomes probable that a cost will be incurred, both USGAAP and IFRS require expense recognition even though a legal liability may not be incurred until a future date. The final point on this slide has to do with bias in the application of accounting standards. Here, it's important for analysts to understand the intent of management. Let's consider a simple example. Let's say that in a given period, there is some major restructuring taking place. And during this restructuring, management incurs a lot of expenses and during this time inappropriately writes down inventory as part of the overall restructuring charges. It might appear that this is conservative because the write down of inventory along with several other restructuring charges will cause earnings numbers to appear lower. But what if the intent of management is to look a whole lot better in the next period by writing down inventory in this period and then selling that inventory at a much higher price in the next period, the earnings in the next period will look really good and management will get credit for that high earnings number. So clearly there is something wrong with this picture and what has been described here is sometimes called cookie jar reserve accounting. This was done by Sunbeam in the 90s and the company then got into trouble for such practices.